Well, good morning again. It's time for today's AM Minnesota program. Going to be a fun program. Big event coming up here in our part of the world. The soil guy, Ray Archuleta, is coming to a number of locations in southern southeastern Minnesota here to talk about that. It's the members of the Land Stewardship Project and a couple of characters that most of us will recognize because they've been here for a while now in Minnesota many times. Steve Poss with the Rice County Soil and Water Conservation District and local farmer Tim Little. And Steve, you got some special guests in the studio today. We do. We're happy to be with uh, folks from the Land Stewardship Project. And of course, Tim, uh, you've been on the program before, local farmer. And we're talking a lot about cover crops and soil health. And I always like to talk to farmers who've been involved in it for a while. They have a little bit of credibility. <laughs> Oh, thank you, and happy Egg Day. Yeah, National Egg Day today. We just had our big Fairville Chamber of Commerce Agribusiness Committee's Farm Business Breakfast. Had a nice crowd over at the, the KC Hall. So let's uh, meet our special guests here with the Land Stewardship Project. First, Sarah Phileas. And uh, Sarah, did you see in the fine print in your contract going on the air with Jerry? It was really small print to other responsibilities as assigned. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that came my way, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> and also Shona Snader, right? Yep, that's right. Good thing you told me that ahead of time because I probably would have guessed Schneider. <laughs> I bet that's happened to you before. Many times, yep. Well, Shona, tell us a little bit about yourself and officially what you do with the Land Stewardship Project. Right, so I'm a soil health organizer at the Land Stewardship Project. Both Sarah and I work on the Soil Health Initiative um, which was started a couple years ago by some of our farmer members. Um, so the Land Stewardship Project is a nonprofit membership-based organization. We have about 4,000 members in Minnesota and throughout the Midwest, um, and they drive a lot of what our organi organization does. And so part of the Soil Health Initiative is to promote these educational events, um, promoting things like no-till cover crops, integrating livestock back on the land, um, and that's that's what we do. And Sarah, what is your official title with the Land Stewardship Project, other than making sure Shona gets up here to Fairbow on time, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so I am also a soil health organizer. I work with uh, my colleague Shona, and uh, we've been spending a good portion of the winter um, meeting with farmers on their farms and just hearing what's working for them and what's been uh, challenging, what barriers they're facing as far as improving soil health. Well, we have to take a break for the markets here in about two minutes. And, of course, we we're going to talk a whole lot more about Ray Archuleta coming to Lewis and Faribault and Austin and Casson. But before we do that, Tim, I want to ask you, because you're a farmer now, way back, granted, it was a long time ago. I was taking soils classes at the university. We never talked about soil health. I vaguely remember that, you know, there's all sorts of microorganisms, and really the soil is alive. But... We were just talking about production practices, we were looking at fertility tests, and we were looking at recommendations. We didn't really talk much about soil health, or did I miss something? Was I dozing that day? <laughs> no, I think you're right, but I, I think growing up, like myself, I grew up on a small dairy farm, and I think we were doing a lot of it and maybe didn't realize it. And, we've, and our practices today, when the cows left, we've gotten more away from it with the corn-soybean rotation, especially in this area. And, uh, and and going with some of these new practices like cover crops, I think it's just returning to, to some of the ways that our dads did it, you know? Yeah, yeah, we were doing things right back then. Yeah, you make a good point. Maybe we just didn't know it. It was just kind of automatic. And then when we got to the corn soybean rotation, maybe we started seeing some things. And thanks to a lot of people working on it, boy, we've learned a lot since then, haven't we? Yeah, we sure are. And, uh, obviously still learning. I'm, I'm real new at it. I'm no expert by any means, but uh, the things I've done in the last couple of years, I am I am seeing some uh, soil health improvement. So, Well, Steve, I always say sometimes when bad things happen, good things come of it. I really hadn't heard much about cover crops till 2013, the prevented plant year when it was raining every spring and, and all at once for our crop insurance, we had to have something planted out there. And since then, it seems like half the meeting notices I get pertain to cover crops. <laughs> yep, I think uh, a large percentage of the farmers out there had to put in some... Just rebooted it. Yep, that's all it took. 
much. It's a just you are saying S O L because all of your music, all of your commercials, everything is on the computer. You're back to the old fashioned way, a live mic, and you try and figure out how to remember how to play a CD and get a CD in so you can try and reboot. <laughs> And hogs have turned mostly firm. They're oversold, but the overall fundamental outlook is bearish. April's up a dime at 63.25, and June means five higher at 76.87. So now we'll have to 10 o'clock. Brownfield market update. The market update was sponsored by the KDHL Agro Boosters. They include Bart Jackson Insurance Agency in downtown Faribault, where Bart is happy to customize the right insurance coverage for you, specializing in farms and businesses. Well, it's a fun program so far in today's AM Minnesota program. Always fun to have a number of guests. So Steve Poss is in studio with the Rice County SWCD, local farmer Tim Little, Sarah Phileas with the Land Stewardship Project, and also Shona Snader. And I, maybe we should start with you, Sarah, because I've been accused I kind of get started talking and lose track of time and what we really should be talking about. So. Let's talk about the soil guy, Ray Archuleta, coming to southeastern Minnesota. I've never heard Ray speak. I've heard a whole lot about him, though, and I guess he's uh, just dynamic as can be. Yeah, we are excited to host Ray for these series of workshops in Baraboe, Austin, and Casson. And uh, Ray was a, a USDA NRCS soil conservationist for about 30 years before he retired. And, and he's formed the Soil Health Academy now and is traveling across the country giving these presentations about soil health to farmers across the country. And I've heard he's uh, pretty exciting too to listen to. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so his presentations are um, very informational, educational, but he also weaves a wonderful sense of humor uh, into his presentations. He has a great rapport uh, with the folks in the audience and really uh, inspires folks. We have a farmer um, that we're working with in Spring Grove, and he said after he saw Ray Archuleta, he just felt really fired up about uh, soil health, and he was really motivated to, to go out and, and um, you know improve soil on his farm. Shona, I assume you were, had a role in, in getting this all lined up too. Was it hard to get on his schedule? And, uh, it, we are making a very efficient use of his time by getting him up here and then you know we've got four different meetings so he can speak to as many landowners as possible. Yeah, um, actually thankfully I've been kind of taking a back seat on this one. It's been Sarah who's been doing a lot of the organizing and she's been doing a really great job. Um, I am mostly right now been focused on um, trying to build our Soil Builders Network, which is the network of farmers in southeast Minnesota. And um, so if anyone's in, uh, any crop or livestock farmer listening right now, if you're interested in joining us, you can check us out online at www.landstewardshipproject.org. It's a way of connecting with other farmers in the area who are doing these soil health practices. Um, we also provide a lot of great resources on um, farmers talking about what they're doing and that can be podcasts, videos, blogs, all sorts of good stuff. Oh, that's really helpful because if you don't have a lot of experience and you don't know what to look for, you don't know how to go about things, you know what, talking to another farmer who's already done it has a lot of credibility. That's right. It's the best way of, of getting um, this education working is farmer to farmer interaction. Um, that is the best way that these farmers are learning and sharing their experiences. And a lot of people are recognizing then that there is something to this soil health. That's right. Um, I mean, the stories that are coming out from some of these people who've been doing it for 20 plus years are just incredible. Um, you know, we have one farmer who is now, at one point, his soil could only infiltrate like an inch and a half of, of water in an hour. Now he's up to over 11 inches an hour. Um, so when we see some of these really heavy rain events come through, He's capturing all that all that precipitation and storing it in his soil for later use. And think what that means then for communities downriver. If you don't have all this water that's rushing down the river, but it's actually being uh, held back a bit on the land. That's right. Now, Tim, you mentioned you have a few years of experience with cover crops. Now, maybe I'm a slow learner. My wife says I'm slow but trainable. She just doesn't say how slow. Last fall, for the first time, well, it was actually early August. I had a pea crop that was gone, obviously too late to plant. 
beans back, so I planted my first cover crop. So I don't have a lot of experience yet, but have you seen some changes in your soil? Yeah, a yeah, oh, couple, three years? Definitely, yeah. It's funny, you mentioned 2013 preventive plant. That's when I actually started. I did skip 2014 because I was still learning about the whole process. And But uh, I had 40 acres and we had done a tile project in, in 2013 and I planted uh, annual rye, radish, and, and uh, clover. But it rained all summer, and then after I planted it in late August, it got dry. Uh, the clover didn't come up hardly at all, but the, the annual rye and the radish weren't too bad. And I did notice a difference, uh, soil tilth, I thought, in the spring. I mean, it was it really helped, and it helped hold that, that soil together. But I had been doing, uh, and I think I've been on, well, that was 2012 when I was on the radio with you, and we were talking about no-till at that time. I was just leaving the corn stalks and planting soybeans into the corn stalks. And I, in my own opinion, I think that maybe helped me transition into the cover crops, because now I've been fall seeding with an airplane uh, cereal rye into standing corn and then no-tilling corn, no-tilling beans, excuse me, into that and seeing some uh, great benefits. Uh, number one, erosion, that's why I started it. And uh, managing moisture, they were talking about hold, water holding capacity, but in a spring like we had last year, it was it was wet, and we were a little worried. It's like, well, what's that going to be like planting into that ryegrass when it's wet? Well, it works just the opposite. That growing ryegrass is sucking up that moisture. And it's transferring out into the atmosphere then, because right, and it and it it really helped us to get in and and get planted, and we didn't have any crusting issues. You heard a lot of crusting issues around that Mother's Day. We were mm -hmm. actually planted a little bit before that, but I had friends that planted on Mother's Day or the day before and into cover crops and there was no crusting issue. So um, yeah, moisture and then uh, nitrogen release in the, in the fall, that, that cereal rye, when it decays, the nitrogen becomes available like in August and that's right when the beans need a kick. So we were noticing a little a yield, yield increase there. Right. And uh, compaction, I've noticed a difference in compaction in the field or the truck traffic in the fall previous year, a lot of times you know, you'll see that little swale in the bean field. That just has gone away. It, it helps carry the, the vehicles. And white mold, because the ground's all covered, you don't have the soil splash. That's a soil born um, yeah, because disease. Because of the, the sclerotia, you know, the rain, they pop, they bounce up, and then they get into the flowers of the soybeans, and now you have the start of the white mold. So, yeah, you didn't have that splash because the soil was covered. Exactly, and we've noticed hands down a difference in white mold, and then weed suppression. If that when that ryegrass starts wilting down and covers up the ground, uh, we've noticed quite an improvement. Not uh, that allopathy effect, plus just having the ground covered, and uh, and then no fall tillage. We talked about that in 2012. No ripper in, in the fall, no digger in the spring. That's 26, 27 bucks an acre. And that uh, and lots of diesel fuel. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and that and that right there alone will pay for your cover crop. So, and I think once you get going and, and doing this, you'll see that the the water infiltration is and in, in some of these things. Some of it's hard to measure, like soil health. You know, erosion. It's hard to put a dollar amount, but if your dirt's not leaving the farm, to me, that's huge. Yeah. So. And that's our most valuable resource is our topsoil. Exactly. Steve, it looked like you wanted to say something that. Well, you know, Jerry, it's really fun to see all the, the guys that are trying cover crops. And they're not just giving it one one year try and say, well, that didn't work. You know, if you planted a corn crop and it failed your first time out, did you go back and plant a second one? You probably did. <laughs> yeah, we planted the next year. Yep. <laughs> and, yep. tried, and you tried to learn from what went right or what went wrong and how we can fix it. Yep. So, you know, it's the same thing with cover crops. You know, you need to do it for a few years to really get a feel for how it works. You know these uh events that we host they really give an opportunity to learn some of the ins and outs of how to do it uh, we made a lot of mistakes our first few years that we worked with farmers doing cover crops and you know those are really valuable experiences to learn from and and help others avoid those common mistakes well sarah that's where like organizations like the land stewardship project it's like an encyclopedia of information of, of people that have tried things so we can learn from what they did it and like when I was first hearing about it something never occurred to me I put herbicides on my soil why 
to keep the weeds from growing so I can harvest uh, more corn and soybeans, but that has an impact in when or what kind of cover crops you plant. Well, it makes sense, but it never popped in my mind, but I didn't have to make that mistake. Exactly, and the, uh, these soil health events that we're hosting featuring Ray Archuleta, they also include a local farm panel. And so there will be local farm panelists um, explaining what's been working on their farm, what hasn't worked, and it's a great opportunity for farmers to come and ask specific questions to those who are using these practices locally. Well, let's go over the specific details. Now, it's going to be in Lewiston and Faribault and Austin and Casson. So, Sarah, why don't you give us the details and hopefully we're going to get you a big crowd there because this is a really exciting topic for a lot of people. Yes, yeah, so next week on Wednesday, March 28th here in Faribault at the Faribault American Legion on 112 5th Street Northeast. And that's um, only about a couple blocks from where we are sitting right now. <laughs> <laughs> the workshop is from 10 to 3 with registration starting at 9.30 and that event is co-sponsored by the Rice County Soil and Water Conservation District. The fee is $20 which includes the noon meal and uh, there's a scholarship rate of ten dollars for students and I'm learning. I'm a family student. members. <laughs> 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 I, I think we all are. Uh, and so we're also going to be uh, on Wednesday evening in Austin at the uh, at the Austin Riverland Community College from six to nine p.m. in the West Campus Garage on 1900 8th Avenue Northwest and this event 6 to 9 uh, with dinner and uh, registration starting at 5:15. so we're encouraging folks to get there early. And I like that idea because a lot of us do have jobs off the farm sure maybe you can organize a vacation day but then again maybe you can so it's nice that there's an, an evening program too for people that you know take a vacation day mm -hmm. trying to make it uh, available for anyone to attend uh, in a few different places because we're also going to be in Casson on Thursday March 29th from 10 to 3 at the Casson events by Saker and that's at 401 8th Street Southeast I think ev everyone knows where that is, driving on Highway 14 by Cannon, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> kind of a, a landmark there. And I assume that you do like the pre-registration because then it makes planning easier for you? Mm -hmm. And so you're welcome to RSVP by phone at 507-523-3366 and uh, preferably by Friday that will help us with the meal count though we're not going to turn anybody yeah. away at the door. And if, so yeah, if somebody finds out the last minute they can go, I almost bet the next mortgage payment that you'd find <laughs> a spot for them or a chair somewhere. <laughs> we sure will. We're hoping to welcome everybody to these events. Oh, it's uh, really exciting. And, and now the real question is, Steve, do you think I know the right people so that I'll be able to get an interview with Ray when he's here? Do you think I know the right people that might be able to make that happen for listeners that would like to hear from Ray and maybe can't get to one of these meetings? I have a feeling you're going to be okay there. Okay? <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll gonna... make sure that you get a chance to meet Ray. And I should also mention, if you didn't get those details jotted down in phone numbers, Aren't computers wonderful? Never thought I'd hear myself saying it, but if you just go to any search engine, land stewardship project, your website pops up. I was putting a post up today, so I wanted to double check on spelling and names and Rice County Soil and Water Conservation District. Guess what? It pops up there. There's right on your home page, you know, yeah. all the information. So, and yeah, I have another uh, other soil and water conservation districts and other areas. I'm sure they're promoting it really well too, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Steve, you wanted to Well, I was it. also going to say, you know, if, if you have trouble finding the LSP website, uh, call the our office as well. You can uh, just let us know if you want to register. Back to talking more about soil health. Are we finding, Steve or Sarah, that there's some way that we can scientifically measure what the health is of our soil in terms of microbial activity? Or is it just some of the things that Tim has been able to observe just by knowing the land and farming the land? There are ways. Uh, there's a few different tests out there now. One's called the Haney test, and that does me measure some of the soil biology to it. Um, so that's yeah, one thing that you can do, but a lot of it is, uh, you know, observations and you're looking at you know, the amount of worm activity uh, out in the soil. Um, 
looking at the color of the soil to you know assess the organic matter in it. So there there are ways. Yeah. Jim, did you want to add something? Yeah, I, he mentioned earthworms, and uh, that was what was huge for me this past summer. Uh, in doing the, the no-till, leaving the corn stalks, planting beans into the corn stalks, I noticed an improvement in, in soil tilth and uh, more earthworms. When I started doing cover crops, it was like throwing the, the earthworms on steroids. <laughs> it, it was, it's crazy. Um, and, I didn't, and I didn't even realize it until last summer I was down to a uh, meeting down in... Uh, Blooming Prairie, and they did, they had a field day with the smoke where they went down and hooked onto a tie line and blew smoke through the tie line, and I didn't realize they had a pit there that was six seven feet deep and there was earthworms that deep in the ground. You can't buy tillage that goes that yeah. deep, so I mean, and, and it's free. Yeah, they got to do this for the hard pan then. Oh, <laughs> it's it's crazy, and they they hooked onto that and. I don't know what it was, 150, 200 yards across the field, there was smoke coming up through the beans. I mean, like right after he started the pump within 30 seconds. So it's crazy how they open the soil up. And uh, back to your question on, on soil, measuring soil health, I think you can tell more with a shovel than any test. Just go out and, and examine your, your own soil, smell it, smell your plants, take your leaves, roll them up, smell them. You can tell it the smell is different between a healthy soybean plant and one that's like say sand, standing in water in, in a in a hard pan it's uh, it's crazy um, and, and the tilth well yeah they just take the shovel how easy does it go into the soil right and what's the soil look like they said they talk about that chocolate cake uh, cottage cheese uh, look and when you pull a pull a soil apart does it snap or does it does it sound like velcro you, know? you kind of want it to crumble, don't you? Yeah, and, 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 and it's the root hairs and the and the, when you get the biology going, it'll sound like you're pulling Velcro apart. It's it's yeah, it's crazy stuff. But this is something I heard, and it is almost scientific way to measure soil activity. And maybe it's an old wise tale, but I heard if you take a, a underwear, cotton underwear, and you bury it in the soil. And then you go back in two or three months, and the idea is if it goes away, you know, if it decomposes, that means you have a lot of soil activity. If it doesn't, that means you don't have so much. Shona, you're smirking at me there. Have you heard that be too? Yes, <laughs> it's called um, Soil Your Undies. And we actually <laughs> sell the kits, so if anyone's interested, we're well, selling so. underwear. <laughs> yeah, but you better make sure you want like a cotton, right? No polyester slacks or something because that's a, a petroleum based product, right? That's that's right. cotton, it's got to be 100% cotton. But it seems logical. The more uh, microbial activity you have there, that's what bre would break down. In, in, right? Yep, that's yep. And then I was going to say, too, another test that we um, are looking more into is we actually purchased a microscope for our office. Um, there's a lot of research and work being done just looking at these microbes under a microscope. And it's really cool once you start um, being able to evaluate your bacteria, your fungi, and then start looking at like some of the predatory nematodes, really seeing how the ecology works in your soil. Um, and we do have a group of farmers who are getting very interested at seeing that microscopic level. When you think about it, your soil, Sarah, is supposed to be alive, right? Yeah, <laughs> and, and that's a major it part is, of it. Yeah, it isn't something that just holds a seed. We put the herbicides on, we put the crop nutrients, and it just holds a seed. No, it's supposed to be alive. <laughs> yeah, and Ray spends a lot of time in his presentations talking about the soil being alive and how to feed that biology in the soil and, and to get it to do work for you on, on your farm, increasing the efficiency yeah. of your farm. Believe it or not, as I mentioned earlier, I planted my first cover crop last summer, and Tim, I saw it instantly because it, it was a little wet when the pea combines were there. Didn't cut up the field, but you can imagine after a few warm days after that what that soil was like. Yeah, we noticed that last fall with the wet fall that we had. We combined for a half a day, and then it went. It started raining for two weeks, and when we got back at it, uh, we noticed a huge difference where we had the cover crops planted as far as standing water and that, yes. Because I got the cover crop planted and I dissed it lightly in because I didn't have a drill. That's a problem. A lot of us don't have the equipment anymore. And I thought it was uh, rather creative. I had the co-op out with an airflow. And then they airflowed the oats on and then I dissed them lightly. And last, I couldn't believe how mellow that soil was last fall. And the oats got up above my knees, planted uh, early in August. Yep. 
Yeah, it'll make quite a difference. I think you'll you'll notice in the spring here too. Yeah. And now you think what that that oats did for me. Now, granted, it was a long time since I took chemistry in college too, but the peas are a legume, so they left some nitrogen behind in the soil. Well, now the oats used that nitrogen, grew up, and now they're decomposing. And the spring, they will slowly release that nitrogen. So I made sure that a heavy rain, I didn't lose it because now my nitrogen is in that crop residue, right? Exactly. Yeah, here I thought I was going to give you a hard time because you weren't doing cover crops this morning and you're doing cover crops. So. <laughs> like my wife said, I'm slow but trainable. <laughs> wow. So I, and I have to tell you this too, Sarah. They always say confession is good for the soul. Because Land Stewardship Project, you've been around for quite a while, haven't you? Yeah, for over 30 years. Yeah, and back, you know, 30 years ago, I'd heard of you and I was kind of the, we were all like the mainstream farmers. You know, well, they're a little bit, I don't know if I buy that, and you know what I mean? And now all I want you to find out, we weren't mainstream, you guys were mainstream. We just It just took us a little while to figure it out. What are you laughing at, Tim? <laughs> <laughs> there certainly is a lot of momentum for the soil health uh, revolution right now. And Tim mentioned too about the worms. What are the worms doing? They're tilling the soil for us. And I don't remember the exact figure, but one worm, how much soil goes through its system and deposited back into soil, but it's mind-boggling numbers. And all that residue from the ryegrass and the corn stalks, it's amazing to me, watching it last summer, how it disappeared. I mean, they're just, they're chowing down. They just, it, it just goes away. And in the process, to, with their castings in the soil, that's where the soil health starts to begin, you know. And one of the biggest benefits of we're adding organic matter. That's water holding capacity for when it gets dry. I mean, Steve, it's all about organic matter, isn't it? Higher organic matter soils, unless you get really high like a peat slough, but it's organic matter that is everything in your soil, right? It, it really is. I mean, it helps supply nutrients to your crop and it, yeah, it holds water. It, it's just the key. Yeah, man. You know, of course, we have soil tests, so we know what our organic matter is. So there you go. That's a way to scientifically, Sarah, you're smirking like maybe I struck on something by accident, right? But that is a way of you can track the, the organic matter in your soil. Right. And, uh, you know, we've been hearing a lot of farmers talking about these weather extremes and the rain events that uh, we've been experiencing in the past few years. And uh, part of these workshop series is going to discuss extreme weather and how does soil health um, improve the resiliency of your farm in order to withstand the, the weather yeah. changes. We're yeah, because you think about you pick up one of those five, six, seven, eight inch rains. That's a lot of weight that is is hitting your soil and packing it down if it's very little residue there or any crop growing. Well, I can't believe we have less than a minute left. Sarah, maybe we better mention uh, those dates again and locations and telephone number in case somebody would like to write it down. But I'm not a computer geek, but maybe I'm close because for me it would be easier to just go and find it on a, on a search engine. But <laughs> <laughs> of course, the landstewardshipproject.org for more information. And we're going to be uh, here in Faribault in about a week at the uh, Faribault American Legion, Wednesday, March 28th, 10 to 3 p.m. And uh, Wednesday in the evening, March 28th, 6 to 9 p.m. in the Austin Riverland Community College. Thursday, March 29th, 10 to 3 at the Casson Events Center in Casson. Sarah, thanks for coming up. Shona, this wasn't so painful, was it? No, it, it wasn't too bad. <laughs> Tim, thanks for coming in, Steve. We've got to get to news from ABC.